Hello, everybody. Welcome to Quantum Catechesis. I'm Father Joe Krupp, and you're not. And I'm fired up to be here on this glorious Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, the light is funny. You're right. Yeah. Um, it makes me look Trumpish. I'm orange. I'm orange. Oh, it's okay. I don't mind. I ain't a pretty man anyway. Sue, I think you're the first person here. Whoa. Okay. Is that too uh, much? I don't know. How does this look, Sue? If, forgetting this, because that ain't going to help. But uh, anyway, welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Today, we're going with um, Coca-Cola instead of coffee. And I have no idea why, except it's what we did. And uh, okay, so today, as you know, is uh, hopefully this week, I mean, I hope you know, is going to be a crazy, exciting week. We are actually pilgrimaging to Wisconsin, okay? Uh, so what does that look like? Well, I think for tomorrow's show, uh, I'll be in meetings, right? So what I'll do, hopefully, is kind of record a show after this. Right, just uh, me yammering away incessantly at the camera without you people here to see, and then uh, maybe put it up tomorrow. I don't know. I'm gonna go by time on that one. If not, maybe we can replay an old one that everybody. A lot of people liked the one on being human. Um, so, uh, anyway, so tomorrow. Why will I be gone tomorrow? Well, because of your sin. Okay, that's not true. I'm gonna be honest. I made that up. Uh, so what's going on tomorrow is uh, I am in the Diocese of Lansing, Michigan. And the Diocese of Lansing is having all the priests converge on Brighton tomorrow. Why Brighton? I think because it's kind of the center. My last assignment, I was in the southwestern corner of the diocese. And so they'd have these meetings and it was like I'd have to set aside the whole day because it was an hour and a half one way. Uh, and uh, so I'm guessing it's because of that. The other is they have a big church, right? So anyway, what we'll do tomorrow is all the priests of the diocese will be gathering to look at some of the data coming back. We're trying to figure out how to do this. And what is this? Uh, a situation where you have more and more Catholics every year and less and less priest to Catholics. So if you look at where I'm at now, uh, basically I have pastoral care of 3,000 families and a school by myself, priest-wise. And you know, like growing up, if you had 500 families, you had two priests. Uh, so that's what's going on. Uh, I won't be able to do the show tomorrow, but I'll certainly be able to do it Friday because we'll be in Wisconsin at the site of the only Marian, approved Marian apparition in our country. Uh, so I'm really geeked about this. After a day of sitting in torturous meetings, we're going to get a car and drive through the night to Wisconsin because this meeting doesn't end till I think sometime. How's that for really clear? But I'll get a nice haircut on my head. So what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about heaven. We covered purgatory, I think fairly to partly cloudy thoroughly, we looked at how Dante described purgatory. We looked at how Dante described hell. And now we're going to look at heaven. And I'm kind of excited about this. Uh, but right at the beginning, I want to make sure and give you the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the reminder that when we describe heaven, we're wrong. And we're more wrong than we are right uh, why? Because there isn't language to convey it. You and I are physical creatures, and heaven will be physical as well as spiritual, but we simply don't have a way to communicate it. So like, I remember when I was a kid, seriously, somehow I got this idea in my head that in heaven it was church all day, and I was trying to think of, well, what would be worse? <laughs> Really? Like, I thought heaven was, uh, you go to mass every day, and I'm like, oh no. I don't like going to Mass twice a week. But it turns out that's not what heaven is. Heaven is somewhat a... Mass is somewhat a prophecy of heaven, and we can get into that if you want. But first, let's just look at heaven. And I want to start by addressing the value of thinking about heaven, because that's super important. 
One of the things that I find uh, is our culture is getting more and more comfortable with a contemptuousness in talking about spiritual things. So, uh, for example, when we talk about the reality of the devil, uh, you have people who just don't want to go there. I remember at one point, well, this actually happened at two different churches I was assigned to, not either of my currents, just so you know. When I went to do the baptism ritual for, for the first time in each of those parishes, the previous priest had crossed out the exorcism ritual in the baptismal book. Holy crap, right? Uh, yikes. We don't do that. We acknowledge the reality of the spirit world, unashamedly so. Um, and we, talk, we, we believe in demons. We believe in the devil. We believe in angels. And, it, and if we say, well, I don't believe in those things, then I hate to be this guy. Then you're, you're not following Catholic teaching at all. And you're not following 2,000 years of tradition and wisdom and revelation. And we want to be careful when we pull that off, right? We want to be real careful with that. The fact that, uh, well, anyway, why go there? Let's get into this. Why is there value in thinking about heaven? Well, first, because it's what you're made for. When humans were created, it was to be one with God. Um, and we will never really find wholeness until then. So St. Augustine puts it this way. Our hearts are restless and they will never rest until they rest in thee. But it's not simply a matter of hanging on until heaven. No, it's heaven all the way to heaven. And it's hell all the way to hell. Uh, the value in thinking about heaven is to contextualize our current pain. I want us to listen to this quote from a guy you may have heard of, St. Paul the Apostle. Has anyone heard of him? Yeah, he's a minor figure in Christianity. I consider... This is what he wrote, Romans 8, 8, 18, 8, 18, Romans 8, 18, Romans 8, 18, Romans 8, 18, Romans 8, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared to the glory to be revealed for us. For creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. For creation was made subject to futility, not because of its own accord, but because of the one who subjected it in the hope that creation itself would be set free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. I'm like, like wow, that's a lot of words. Okay, let's break it down, okay? I was going to break it down, like in the 80s. Do people still say that? Break it down! <laughs> But then I remembered I can't dance. So when he says the, cons the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared to the glory to be revealed for us. What is he saying? Well, this is a man who at this point had been tortured, abandoned, betrayed, uh, rejected, uh, almost killed a few times, thrown in jail, beaten within an inch of his life. And what did he say? Oh, that's nothing compared to the glory I'll see one day. Um, the first thing we learned from St. Paul about heaven is that it can contextualize our current pain. C.S. Lewis wrote quite a bit about this. The idea that it's kind of this simple. We say in heaven, it won't be this way. And the fact that we can even contemplate a reality without pain would seem to suggest it exists because you've never experienced a reality without pain. Neither have I. It's impossible. We have never experienced perfection, but we can ponder it and we can pine for it, which C.S. Lewis would say, that's one of our hints that heaven is real because there's nothing I've ever experienced that isn't real. Uh, so I can say, think of an animal that doesn't exist. And all you and I can do is take parts of animals that do and make one. That's all we can do. We can only work with the data we got.
And we can contemplate heaven even though we've never seen it or experienced it. That's our first clue. Um, and that's Paul's point. He says all of creation, not just humans, but the, the, the grass, the animals, uh, that they await with eager expectation. Why? He says because creation was made subject to futility. Now this one, I want you to stick with me on. Okay? If you think about what you pine for, what do you long for? Don't answer that question, sweet Lord, because I would assume for most of us it falls into one of two or three categories. We'll stick with food because this is a G-rated show. <laughs> right? Me, I love food. I just had two hot dogs. And if you offered me a third, I'd eat it. Am I hungry? No. Do I know that eating that hot dog won't really help me in any way? Yes. Will I eat it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. And I will eat it knowing I haven't helped myself. I don't need more nutrients. Right? And eating it, in fact, would probably mess up my belly. That's the futility and on a tiny scale. And we experience it in a million ways. We know when we engage in certain behaviors that it's not going to help or would only help a little bit. And yet we do it anyway. This is the futility we all experience. Ask yourself why a multimillionaire has to have more money. There's nothing practical about the answer. And if you give them more money, then their first thing is, well, I want more. What uh, Nelson Rockefeller, no, t -t -t Rockefeller dad, the first one, the big one. John, John Rockefeller. Okay, the richest human being to exist in the history of our country. At one point, he had a quarter of our country's GDP. Uh, Bezos, who is, I think, the richest American now, isn't close to that. Just to give you a sense of how insanely rich he was. There is no equivalent we have. Someone just said this recently. If you combined Buffett, Bessos, and uh, Gates, they don't have half of what Rockefeller did. Okay? And here's the quote from him that I, I just can't get over. He was still screwing people out of money. He was still crashing businesses for no other reason. And then somebody said to him, when's enough? What do you want now? And his exact answer was, quote, more. <laughs> what do you want now? More. This is the futility that we are all subjected to. Okay? I, stupid thing. I love the Tigers. I do. I, like... When baseball season was set back, and I'm serious, I was embarrassed at how sad I was. Do you remember this? Like, I was literally, like, deeply sad. And, you know, eventually we got the season, and we had a good year. I don't think anybody saw us doing this well. But even then, sometimes sitting there watching the Tigers, which I had pined for, I started doing other things. Right? Why? I got what I wanted. This is the futility we are all, we know on some level, all of our pursuits, almost all, are only going to expose us to futility. Nobody commits a sexual sin and says, well, that's enough, I'm done. Uh, when I was a smoker, right, I used to be a crazy smoker. And uh, a buddy who helped me quit, and I tried 900 times to quit, but there was no line that helped me more than this one. You ready? One is too many, and a thousand won't be enough. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. If you gave me a thousand cigarettes, I would need more. That's, th that's just how it is. And if I had one, well, that's too many, because what I learned is I can't have one. Right? That's addictive behavior. But it is, all addictive behavior is, is a freight train of futility. How am I doing? I, I hope this doesn't sound dark to you because I don't intend it dark. It's simply liberating truth. 
It helps us contextualize the joys we pursue. So why are we talking about this? Because Paul says that's programmed right into the equation. God needs you more in love with what's to come. That's why creation subject to futility. In the hope, ready? Quote, that creation would be set free from slavery. Because you and I, we keep this uh, third grader definition of freedom, right? What's freedom? Well, I get to do what I want. No, that's not freedom. That's not, right? Because what do I want? More. And if you give me what I want, then it no longer becomes what I want. Eventually it becomes what I need, and then it becomes what I must have. Haven't, haven't we all experienced this? The, the slavery is, you know, what we call freedom often leads to slavery. What do I want right now? Well, this isn't true anymore. It's been like 10 years. But four years after I quit smoking, if you would have said, what do you want? I want smokes. I want more smokes. Why? If freedom is what I want, then I'd have another cigarette and I would be chaining myself. Ask an alcohol, recovering alcoholic, what do you want? I would like to drink. But that's slavery to me. We were made to be free. Freedom's hard. Slavery's easy. In this sense, dear Lord. It's such a crazy time. We have to be so careful of everywhere we say, because there are people who just listen to be offended. God loves us. I've done this, right? I tweeted one time, God loves us. And the first response was, you have to tell people to repent too. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> We're all insane, right? We all run around with our little agendas and just making sure. <laughs> this is part of the futility too, right? All of this. And all of that futility is supposed to be our fuel to not immerse all of our beautiful energy in the temporal meaning it will pass away, but in the eternal. Okay? Some of you may not have known who John D. Rockefeller was or how rich and powerful he was. I don't know. But that was just in the last hundred years. I can tell you, I'm trying, I always forget his name. Crashes, Marcus Crashes. We believe is the richest human who ever lived. Have you heard of him? We believe he's the richest human who ever lived. He owned 50% of the Roman Empire about 30 years before Christ was born. Was he an emperor? No, he's just a senator. <laughs> how crazy is that? You know how he died? Do you know this one? He tried to conquer the Parthians. Let me just say this. Oops. And when they wiped out his army and captured him, they melted gold and poured it down his throat. That's going to leave a mark. Crassus was the richest human who ever lived. C-R-A-S-S-U-S. -S -S, and most of you have never heard of him. Futility, 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 futility. Okay? So for you and me, you and I, we see the temporal things that God offers us. You spelled it wrong. We see the temporal things. C-R-A-S-S-U-S. -S -S. Okay. He was a member of the first triumvirate with Julius Caesar and Pompey Magnus and Marcus Crassus. What? Let's see if I can do the second triumvirate. Augustus, Mark Antony, and, oh, Lepidus. Oh my gosh, I remembered. Holy cow, you got, okay, anyway, sorry. That was really stupid that I know that. <laughs> and it's a little embarrassing, okay. <laughs> Asked me about the third triumvirate. There wasn't one. So anyway, all of this futility is supposed to help us enjoy those temporal things appropriately and remind us of the eternal thing that's coming. How are people doing? I can't Pretty tell. Good. Are you guys happy? Yes. Okay, let me drink some caffeine here. I can't tell. They're happy? Yes. All right, okay. Are you sure? Yes. I'm sorry, but I, I can't delete the, what I spelled wrong. And it upsets Carrie's me. trying to fix the it's fact that she ruined Marcus <laughs> Crash's name for all eternity. 
Okay, so that's Paul's point about heaven. What is the value of heaven? Well, the value of thinking about heaven is that it helps us contextualize our time on earth and helps us to appropriately enjoy the temporal joys without being enslaved to them. And that's tough to do. That requires some discipline and some context. Okay, great, you guys. So I see hearts. Everybody's happy. Woohoo! I get, I get insecure. I can't I see your faces. I'm that guy. It's what makes preaching during a coronavirus hard. I'm serious. I go by people's faces. And I can only see the phone. Yeah. Kind of enjoy that. So what else were we talking about? Heaven, 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 heaven. Think, think, think. Oh, here's a really cool image. And this comes from Dr. Peter Kraft. Okay. Oh, Paul Bolt's here. Can I thank him? Yes. Okay, guys, see Paul Bolt. Last week, he brought an amazing lunch for Pastor Williamson and, and his beloved and me and dad. And it was so nice. Thank you, Paul. We're really grateful. Um, and, and Paul's a lovely, lovely man. I see him every weekend at Mass with his, with his angel of a daughter. And uh, I, I don't know. He just shines. Yes. He does, doesn't he? Yeah. He just has a pure heart. What's that? Touch my face? Yeah, on there. On the screen. Oh. It's glowing. Ooh. But see, when I do that, I feel like Donald Trump. I look orangey. <laughs> do I look orange to you people? No. I should run for office. Yeah. Build the wall <laughs> around our parking lot. Will you donate? To, wouldn't that be hilarious if that was my approach? Run for president for no other reason than to try to raise funds for the parish. <laughs> Those pack, that pack money, holy cow. I am thinking about running for president. Wouldn't that be hilarious? <laughs> what would my slogan be? I won't screw things up. That's it. I'll be polite during I'll a, be polite. During a debate. During debate. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? In fact, I think I would try for the opposite. Like what I would try to do is when they ask me a question, I would pretend I'm freezing. Ready? Like this. They'd be like, uh, Joe, what is your position on taxes? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and then eventually everyone would get uncomfortable. <laughs> Oh, no, I was uncomfortable with that, everything. <laughs> oh, last night? Yeah, Dad and I watched the Yankees, and I don't like the Yankees. Uh, who are they playing? Uh, Indians. I was kind of rooting for the Indians just because Indians just pounded us. This Okay, stop. Sorry, I'll focus now. So Dr. Peter Kraft, okay, gave this groovy, groovy image, okay? And I hope it helps us with our sufferings on earth because we suffer. Guys, right? We suffer. Um, right now, depression, I, I've, I mean, uh, you know, there's darkness, which, which I call it. I struggle with darkness. But there's depression, which is a clinical, um, chemical struggle. And a lot of our brothers and sisters uh, sitting around us at Mass struggle with it. It's tough. It's brutal can't reason your way out of it. You can't cowboy up out of it. It requires help. And, and while we'll look at someone with a, a busted leg and say, ah, poor guy, and try to help him, when we look at someone who might be struggling with a chemical imbalance, we don't have the same reaction. Isn't that weird? And it's very sad, right? But anyway, okay, here's the deal. So Peter Kraft said thinking about heaven can help us contextualize our suffering now in this way. He said, think of a, um, a baby in the womb and pretend it can dialogue with you, okay? So now you are talking with a seven-month-old baby in the womb. And he says, what that baby might be trying to figure out is what these things are on its torso, these two stems, his legs. You might say, well, those are for walking. Well, what's walking? He wouldn't have any concept of that, right? And then he might ask you, well, why do I have these things right here? A lot of energy, uh, a lot of my nutrients are going toward these arms and legs. I don't need those. You're like, well, you don't need them now but you'll need them when you're born. 
Well, what about these two things, right? Right here. They take up a lot of my nutrients and energy and a lot of my existence toward developing and refining. I, I, what are these? Well, those are eyes. They help you see. See what? It's dark in here. Yeah, but when you're born, you'll need them. Right? And do I need to go on and on? He said, when we get to heaven, this is Lewis. No, 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 not Lewis. Craved. He said, when we get to heaven, so much of the pain we experienced on earth will make sense. Right? That in the same way that that little one in the womb can't understand why all of its energy is being used up on things that, that it's never going to need, you say, well, you'll need it in the next life. And that's what God says to us in this life. Why am I suffering like this? You'll need it for the next one. Why? I don't know. I've not been to heaven. I've been close. Not really. I was going to make a joke about the Tigers winning the World Series in 84. Okay? So guys, when you and I are hurting and we can't figure out why, when we're suffering the things we can't figure out why, I don't know why either. But I do trust God that it's connected somehow to this life and or the next. Before I think I shared this before, right? But before my mom had Alzheimer's, I would bump into people who have family who have Alzheimer's, and I'd feel bad for them. That's ah, terrible. I'm sorry. But holy cow. Once you've been through that freight train, anytime someone says it to you, it's a whole nother level of pain for them. You can't know. And I, I don't mean that to be dramatic and I'm fine, right? I say that because when I then bump into people who say my, my mom has Alzheimer's or my papa has Alzheimer's, I can hurt with them in a way I couldn't before. And not because I was bad before. I just didn't have that experience. And in those magic moments, the first year of her diagnosis, where all of a sudden her mind was clear just for two minutes, it was so glorious. And I never took it for granted again. Isn't that cool? The ability to have your mom look at you and know who you are, that's something we all take for granted. The ability to see your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Heaven helps us with the now. And that's why we need to be careful of these people who are contemptuous. Oh, pie in the sky when you die. A, I can have pie now, and it's pretty tasty. But that's not what heaven's about. That's not what thinking about heaven's about. It actually is kind of a mortar that helps us hold all the crazy, unrelated bricks together in our life. So... Um, give me a second. Exercise. I think we're doing pretty good, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Any? Uh, do we? Ha I didn't even look if nope. we have questions. Okay. So, I got itchy beard. Hold on. There. I itched it. It's done. Um. Give me a second. What then will make heaven heaven? Okay. Oh, sorry. Can I do one more point on thinking about heaven? How it helps us now. Yeah. Okay, and I want you to think of beautiful little, I don't know why I say little, he might have been huge, beautiful St. John the Apostle, okay? Um, beautiful St. John the Apostle, he was the last one killed. All his buddies were dead, okay? And honestly, killed pretty grim, okay? Um, and there he was sitting in exile on this little crappy island called Patmos, right? And uh, I read a neat thing evaluating why didn't he get executed and basically what you've got is the romans were hedging their bets that's what i've read okay that romans were deeply religious people uh pagan romans were much more religious oddly enough than christian romans okay uh, oh yeah uh but it wasn't a religion tied to morality it was just worship god didn't matter what you did in life, just as long as you worshipped and honored the gods. Judaism was the first and only religion for about 2,000 years to introduce that idea that the gods or God and morality were connected. Everybody else, you do what you want. Just make sure you honor the gods. Why are we going there? Um, John the Apostle. Uh, am I eating peas? No, it's a nicotine mint. Don't. 
Don't tell them. Don't advertise for that. I'm not advertising, am I? Well, kind of. Can I get free stuff from Rite Aid? <laughs> Wait, if I show you this, Rite Aid, will you give me nicotine? No. No? no. I haven't had a cigarette in 10 years, but I haven't dipped in three. It's still there. What is still there? The crave. Oh, totally. Yeah. Anyway. What were we talking about? God. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> Heaven. Heaven. Does anyone remember? John the Apostle. John the Apostle. Okay, there we go. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, no. And guys, every time you see me do something like this or see me do something like this, just think of this. I'm in charge of two parishes and a school. You should be afraid. The good thing about me being your pastor is, oh, you're going to pray. You're going to pray. It's like, Lord, send us a good priest. Okay, so... Uh, John the Apostle, sitting on a little island in exile, last one left, and what did he write? Okay, I love this. You ready? First John 1, I think. I have it memorized. He says, um, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But when it's revealed, we'll be like him, because we'll see him face to face. So there's John saying, um, we're God's kids now. And, and we should spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, it's really remarkable. For those of you who have kids, what does it mean to you then when God says, well, you're my kid? Do you ever think about that? Think about the love, the defensiveness the craziness you feel to your child. Think about the connection. Think about the fact that they could spit in your face and tell you you're a bad parent and you would bleed for them. Still. Okay? And that was what John's talking about when he says, we're God's kids now. That, that we should spend a lot of time thinking about it. Thinking about the fact that more than a few times the scripture says that God delights in you. So we think about that. And then he says, but it's going to be even better than that. Because we're going to see him face to face. Like one of the ways that I fell in love with <clears throat> baseball, right? I had watched baseball and then I gave up during the big strike. Do you remember the big strike? Okay. And I said, I'm done with baseball forever. Right. And do you know what got me back? I think I told you this. Ichiro. Yes. Yeah. I, somehow a game was on somewhere I was and I watched Ichiro hit a baseball. And the man, if you love baseball, you know what I'm talking about. He was just a poet. I, I, I truly think one of the greatest hitters God ever made, right? You talk about, uh, of course, Ted Williams. You talk about, of course, Ty Cobb. And uh, what's his name? Um... Uh, Gwen, Tony Gwynn. Each row's right up there to me with those three. Right up there. And if, why? And, and stick with me. This is a good analogy, I think. I, just watching him, it, there was just something so beautiful and perfect about the way he swung that bat. Okay? And so then what happened? I started thinking about how much I love infield play, which is my favorite part of baseball. And and then I'm watching games and watching games. What got me back into baseball? Seeing one of the best hitters God ever made. When John says we're going to see him face to face, I want you to kind of think of that or think of your own example from your life. Namely, God will be so perfect and beautiful to us that we will never choose less again. We will never choose less again. That if at that moment we saw God, we were offered uh, a $10 billion and a perfect, easy, happy life on earth, it wouldn't even be remotely tempting. Okay. When we see him face to face, it'll be terrifying. Make no mistake. And why will it be terrifying? Because what we thought was love was a pretty shallow knockoff. 
And, uh, you know, every time the angels appeared to someone, what's the first thing they have to say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Right? Because love looks terrifying some days. Uh, and again, if you're a parent or if you've got one or had one, you know that some days love looks like a face so angry it's scary. And not angry because it hates you, but because it loves you. Right? Love is... Love's terrifying. I, I don't know how you married people do it. I always tell you that, but it's true. Oh, Father, you make such a sacrifice. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go buy soup. <laughs> Once we see him, we will either be completely repulsed by him or totally smitten with him, and there's no third option. And the people who will be repulsed by him will be those who have bent love so much that that which is love will look hideous to them. If you read Paradise Lost by Milton, you remember that when the devil left heaven and he was trying to figure out how he's going to exist or ever be happy without God, what was the devil's comfort? Do you remember this? Where he said to himself, evil, be thou my good. Ugly, be thou my beautiful. Lies, be my truth. It was the only way he could do it. He had to... So bend reality around himself so that he could convince himself that that which is beautiful is ugly. Have you noticed? Now, I might get in trouble for this. So I'm going to look at you. And if at some point you do this, then I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay, how are we doing for time? All right. You have to tell me if this is offensive. I don't mean it offensive because what I'm saying I think might be subjective. And if so, it's just my opinion. But it might be objective, which means I'm right. I don't know which. But if you look at fashion through the years, right? So you look at what people wore in the 20s and you might say to yourself, wow, look at that. I just got tangled in my own beard. You might say to yourself, I don't think I would be comfortable in that. But you do find it lovely. Right? You know, the old suits and the way in the hats and all this. And then if you look at each generation, you look at each generation, the defining things that are beautiful stopped being beautiful. It became about distorting ourselves. Right? And so you look, and, and who was it talking about this? It was an interview my sister sent me where it was a model, and I, I don't know women's sizes, sorry but where she was a six, and that means she's plus-sized, okay? And what do they want? These uh, androgynous, non-sexual, objectively creepy-looking creatures. Seriously. Imps. And we're calling that beauty now. Yes. Seriously. It's because we just keep getting farther and farther from reality and more and more immersed in our utter brokenness. We don't call it brokenness anymore. Right? I'm sorry, let me put my glass on because I think... That is! Oh my gosh, you guys! That's Ken Godwin. I went to school with him. I mean, just a great human being. I'm serious. I knew it. I could barely see, but I thought I saw Godwin. Ken, my gosh, what a great thing to see him. I mean, not see you. I can't see you. <laughs> but I see you. So that's the key, guys. It's the farther we get away from truth, the more we call that which is ugly beautiful. And then what happens when we've so programmed ourselves to lies, what will happen when we see the truth? Is this making sense? Yes. And this is where we get into, and again, please hear me, okay? You can disagree with someone and love them. We even now are pretending that we can change gender by thought. We're now even, we're so contemptuous of truth that we're saying, well, you can say you feel something, uh, what do you say? I feel like a man, even though I was born a woman. Well, how do you even know what that feels like? This is not to say, please hear me. We treat anybody with this affliction 
We treat them, they are God's kids and we will be held to judgment for how we treat people, right? Jesus is super clear about that. But we've actually become so contemptuous of truth that we're now comfortable saying, not, boy, that's, that's not good. We can help. We want to help you feel whole. We just go, well, let's just change the truth. That's easier. Then I don't have to walk with you. I hope I'm making sense. Yes. So what happens when we have a whole culture raised on the idea that there's no such thing really as truth? There's just opinion. What happens when that culture sees truth face to face? What happens when that culture sees truth face to face? It'll hate it. And that's why when people say, well, God would never send anyone to hell. Of course he wouldn't, but a bunch of people will pick it. They'll pick it. If you spent your whole life hating truth, you won't go anywhere near it when you see it face to face. If you pick, spend your whole life pretending that hate is somehow love, you'll hate love and you'll walk away from it. We need to have a radical humility with how we face the world around us. A radical humility. Why? Because we don't know what we don't know and we don't know much about God. You know, so you saw my buddy Ken Godwin, right, is here. So when he and I knew each other well, right, in high school, he's a fantastic trumpet player, uh, just a good human being. Uh, when I knew him, if you would have asked me at 16, for example, what love is, I would have told you passionately and eloquently what love is, and it would have all had to do with how I felt. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, if you've been married more than an hour, you know that love has very little to do with how you feel. Should I be contemptuous of that 16-year-old boy? Oh my gosh, no, he was lovely. He did his best. But if I felt that way now, then I'm screwed. I have grown in my understanding of love and each stage I can look back on with contempt or say, well, that was necessary for me to get to this point. And here's the key. Here's where humility comes in. And I've got a lot farther to go. I have to understand that what I call love now, in 10 years, I'll be embarrassed that I called that love. How are we doing? Good. Praise God. Okay, so this is when we talk about judgment, when we talk about heaven, it's very simple to say. We'll either have spent our life conditioning ourselves to knowing and being open to what truth and beauty and uh, life is, or that stuff that we'll have hated. And if we hated it here, we'll hate it there. Do people in hell want to be in hell? No, but they'd rather be there than be in heaven because they have so distorted themselves that beauty looks like ugly to them. How are we doing? I'm kind of feeling a little how you done today. A little how you done. This is why we pray, right? This is why we pray, because every time we pray, we know God just a touch better. Every time we pray, we allow God to bend us a bit to be more like him and less like us. Did I ever tell you my theory about how we became so contemptuous of truth? Did I ever tell you this? Dying to hear it. Really? Yes. Okay. Now, this is a part of a talk I gave at Yale. Um, was it Yale or the other one? Harvard. Yale. Okay. Okay. And I have to tell this story. No, I shouldn't tell this story. But Tony Blair was there, right? Front row. And this is the part. I No, I can't tell you that. So, what? What? I sh okay. Okay. I hope you all love me. And this was years ago. Just between us and these 220 people. I was hungover. <laughs> my niece got married the night before. And I never do this. I never get drunk, right? My last name's Krupp, and I'm Catholic, and I'm a priest. I'm begging to be an alcoholic, <laughs> right? So I'm like, I never get drunk. But this was truly just not paying attention. And at the end of the night, they were like, okay, everyone, let's go home. And I stood up and I went, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I'm not on a boat. So please forgive me. And I hope I'm not scandalizing anyone. Okay. But so I had to get on a plane at five, like three hours later. 
and fly out to give this talk on postmodern deconstructionalism. Okay. And what it is, is it's a simple thing to explain. Okay. There's two ideas of truth, uh, subjective or objective. What is objective? It's the idea that truth exists and that we can know it. And what it means is when my, uh, I have a family member who's Muslim. And when he says, I believe in Allah, and I say, well, I believe in Jesus, one of us is wrong. Okay? Uh, that's it. And we both acknowledge that. Now, American culture, no, no, no. Oh, some say God, some say Allah. Well, we got about a million people in each religion slaughtered by the other that might disagree with that. You know? Right? We pretend we pick nice over real. And there's a way to be very nice and say, I think you're wrong about God. Does it mean you're going to hell? No, I don't make that call, right? <laughs> I've, who am I? I'm just some dumb redneck from Montrose, okay? So we have objective truth, which is the knowledge that truth exists and that I can know it. There's opinion and there's truth. Now I can have something that I think is truth but then it turns out I'm wrong, in which case, what do I need to say? Huh, I was wrong. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. There's something wrong with not admitting you're wrong. There we go. Anyway, but then there's this thing called subjectivism. Subjectivism says there is no real truth. There's what you believe is true and what I believe is true, and they're equal. And our society embraced that. Okay, you ever heard this? Speak your truth. Crap on your truth. Right? Your truth means nothing to me. My truth should mean nothing to you because I am not the arbiter of truth. I'm a disciple of it. Okay? Um, and again, it goes back to our efforts to be nice in a multicultural society. So we'll say, well, you say Buddha, I say Jesus. Oh my gosh, that couldn't be more messed up. Because Buddha and Jesus said very different things, right? In Buddhism, you seek to alleviate pain by alleviating the cause of pain, namely ambition. In Christianity, we enter pain. We think pain is transformative, right? We enter pain so we can be better. Two totally different philosophies. And it's disrespectful to say, well, you say Buddha, I say, I say Jesus. Heck no, one of us is right. And is I hope it's us, because I put a lot of my chips in the center of the table on that puppy. And I believe it's us. I've studied the snot out of it. Okay? So subjectivism is always easier and seems nice because what it does is says, well, let's get along. You say A, I say B, uh, you know, it's neither, it's both. Now nah, it's one of them or it's neither, I guess. I didn't think of that. But once you root subjectivism in, the lie of it is exposed. And that's where you move to the next stage, <laughs> which is deconstructionalism, meaning... Well, there is no truth. Once you say you have your truth, once we confuse opinion and what we want to be true with truth, then we lose all respect for truth. We say, well, there isn't any. And if anything has made that clear, it's the last 20 years in our country. Look at the abortion debate. We're not even talking about the only thing in that debate that matters, right? Is that, are we talking about a human being or not? That's the only question that matters. Literally, that's it. Well, it's just a clump of cells. Well, you're a clump of cells. Can I kill you? Well, it's not. It can't function outside of its mother. Sure, let me drop you in the woods. See how you do for a week. <laughs> you can't function outside of this construct. Well, it's not cognizant. Well, so next time you're asleep or in a coma, I get to kill you? What the hey? This is all stupid. What do we do? We answer it with cliches. My body, my choice. If it was your body, it would have your DNA. Right? And my choice stops at your existence. Is it my choice to go 100 mile an hour on the, this 35 zone? Sure. But it kills you, so I shouldn't do it. Okay? It's only one argument. 
are we talking about a human or not? And I'll have that discussion. And I've had that discussion with beautiful pro-choicers who I trust their motives. I trust their heart. And when we talk about it, we talk as people who love each other because they're willing to address the only question that matters. Are we talking about a human or not? That's all that matters. But in a post-truth society, all we got to do is scream louder. All we got to do is fight dirtier. That's it. Truth is hard, but it liberates us. I could go on and on. I'm in so much danger of doing that. I'm sorry. It's good. And here's the other thing, right? So right now, somebody put any baseball player, just name any baseball player in the chat, okay? And I'm going to put on glasses and look. The first baseball player's name that comes up, I'm going to show you something cool. Trust me on this. It's actually helpful. My glasses are funny. Has anybody put one up yet? I can't see. My glasses are all bendy, aren't they? Well, that didn't help. I shouldn't be in charge of anything. Is someone going to put a baseball player's name up there? Or any athlete? There. Oh, someone is? It's Give me little, one. It's a little delayed. Go on. Do it. Go on. Do it. Do it. Go oh, 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 oh. Okay. So you said God's favorite baseball player of all time. So what I'm going to do, watch. I you type Ichiro. Jet Lemon. Oh, it's too late. You gave me Ichiro. We're going Ichiro. So I typed Ichiro in. This came up. Now I click this button, and here's what I can tell you. You ready? Seriously. What did it take me? Four seconds? Of course, our internet just pooped out. Here we go. Okay. All right. Let's let's throw this out at you. Um, first MLB player to enter the Japanese Hall of Fame. Uh, 353 career batting average. 1,278 hits. Or total MLB hits, 3,089. 117 taters. He wasn't a power hitter. 780 ribbies and 509 stolen bases. Did you hear that? Took me four seconds. Okay? Four seconds. That's what it took me. And I just read to you all the major stats for a guy who hasn't played baseball in about eight years. Why is that important? Because we don't have to work for truth anymore. We don't have to work for truth anymore. We can get information in no time at all and ask the second generation rich kid how much respect they have for money. They don't have any. It's just too easy to get. Where Ken and I grew up, <laughs> you appreciated money because you didn't have a ton of it. You worked your tail off for it. And I look at my classmates like him, and I'm so proud. I see them on Facebook, and they're working their tails off. Why? Because they know what it's like to not have. So they fight for it. And it's the same with truth. Because truth and information is so easy to get, we've actually confused information and truth. We flooded the market with info, and now we call info truth. So of course we're contemptuous of it. I could right now type in as each row the greatest hitter of all time, and what will I get? Two extremes. One that says yes, two that says no. And they will make their case. And I got to pick. Now, I guess that's actually subjective, really. That is a subjective question. But you get the idea. When, when I was younger, seriously, if I wanted to get stats on a baseball player, I had to take my bike to the library, which was about a three-mile, four-mile bike ride, Go into the card catalog. Y'all remember this? Go over to those wooden uh, knobby things that had the newspapers on them. Remember that? If I wanted to see how my Tigers did, because there were only three channels, right? And we could only get two. You turn that little wooden thing, remember this? With the newspapers on it? It was two hours work to find out the box score of last night's game. So what did you do? You appreciated information. It was hard to get. You had to work for it. And when you work for something, you respect it. We don't have to work for information anymore. So we have no respect for it. And now it's a bludgeon instead of the thing we sit worship. Right? One of my favorite historians, I got to sit with him, and he's an atheist. And we had a nice lunch together. And at one point, he said something to me. I'll bet it's hard for you that I'm an atheist. I'm like, no, I, I did. I said, I don't think you're such an atheist. I think you think you are. I said, but you worship truth. You do. I, I read your stuff. 
All he cares about is truth. And that's what's always, Duncan, dad met him too. That's what's always oppressed me about him. My favorite historian, if he hits a conclusion that makes him uncomfortable, he goes after it. He doesn't attack it. He tries to find out. And I said, bro, you worship truth. I worship truth. I just call him Jesus. You'll get there. You can't love truth this much and, and not be saved one day. That's my opinion. How are we doing? I feel like I went off. No, it's good. So heaven is truth. Truth is heaven. It usually hurts at first. But ultimately, man. Yeah. And here's the other thing about heaven. Are you ready? Heaven is when your self-obsession dies. Because you'll finally see something you love more than you. And you think, oh, I love everything more than me. No, you don't. <laughs> We're broken. Right, I get it. What makes, and again, I hope this isn't crude, and, and I don't intend this crude. I really don't. And parents, if you've got little ones in the room, right? But again, we're going to go with Peter Kraft, okay? <laughs> and here's what Kraft says. He says, when I join, am joined to my wife sexually, I'm given a glimpse of heaven because I am wrapped up in her and I'm unaware of myself for just a few moments. All I'm aware of is giving myself to her. And he says, that's why sex and heaven are so similar. Right? And what does that time with his wife do? Produces the possibility of creating something immortal, an immortal soul that'll outlast time. When we then take that act of sex and reduce it to the good feeling and then even try to kill the consequences of it because they're inconvenient, that's hell. Because it's taking the most selfless thing and making it self-obsessed. This is why we say heaven will be a state of ecstasy. It's Greek, ecstasis, out of ourself. We'll be free of the tyranny of ourselves and we'll be completely other, right? Remember when, when John was on that island in exile, St. John, and God kind of cracked open heaven and let him peek, remember this? And one of the things he saw was that all the people in heaven were offering up the prayers of the people on earth. Dude, and you know how it is. If I gave you a day to be all about you, that's glorious. I had one Monday. Truly, guys, Monday was one of the best days I've had and I don't know how long. All I did was read. I literally just read all day. I walked and I read. I sat and I read. I laid and I read. It was glorious. I read over a thousand pages. I was just in heaven. Tuesday, I woke up and I had another shot at that day. And I walked away from it for a simple reason it wouldn't have been as enjoyable. Why? Because it needs to be rare that I spend a day on me. And if I keep spending days on me, then it's not only going to not make me happy, it's going to break me. I hope I'm making sense. You and I were made for others. And to some extent, we know that it's just too hard, so we don't do it. We were made for service. If I said, go spend a day at the soup kitchen, and I mean a day, you'd see what I mean when you walked away tired and content all at the same time. And it's not like the movies. You go work at a soup kitchen, they're nuts. It's awful. People are rude, they're angry, they're crazy, and they smell. <laughs> right? I'm telling you. It's not like we're like, oh, thank you for the soup. Some of them are, but a lot of people are homeless because they're broken. And you're running into some things. But you walk away and you're whole because you're doing what you were made for. You were giving instead of taking. Yeah. Ah, all right. I'm going on and on. It's one o'clock. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I can't tell you for sure about tomorrow. Okay? Uh, we may replay an old show. 
Oh, we might more. I think what we're going to do is play your okay quotation. Yeah. Okay. So about I'm going to say five years ago, four years ago, um, the U.S. bishops asked priests to go on a thing called I think pericope, per, per, uh, I'm just trying to pull it periscope. Up. Yeah. Periscope, and tell our vocation story. So I told mine. I was driving to the hospital, I think. Um, and in my last assignment, it was an hour drive to the hospital, so to the closest one. Uh, so I did it, and I think we'll play that. If I can, if I have time today and the energy, then I will uh, try to record something for tomorrow. But I think we'll probably... Anyway... Friday's the big day. Guys, I'm so fired up. We will be in Wisconsin live from the Marian Shrine there. The only approved Marian apparitions in our country. And I'll tell you about the incredible miracle that happened there. Um, and uh, I think that'll take us home. Yeah. So um, all throughout the show, people have been giving their intentions. That's what oh, I'm most people Bless you guys. Busy. Okay. Thank you for giving us your intentions. I promise you, I'm looking at you all. We will carry them to our mother. Okay, and then uh, Pat Krupp, uh, I want you to know I got your prayer today through my dad, and I'm going to carry you there, woman. And um, same with uh, a couple others who uh, texted me. So thanks, guys. I hope this was uh, helpful today. I hope it was a good challenge for us today. Uh, we can live for others or we can live for ourselves. Um, and the words of uh, what's his butt? St. Paul, none of us lives for ourselves. And none of us dies for ourselves. For while we live, we are responsible to God. And when we die, we die as his servants. So in both life and death, we belong to God. Isn't that cool stuff? Woo! All right. So uh, what are we going to do now? Right. Wrap it up. Oh, wrap it up. Okay. And then uh, I'll give you a little ayyidna. And then I will for sure see you Friday. Tomorrow you will see a recorded version of me when I was about 30 pounds lighter and had no beard. <laughs> yeah. I kind of, did I tell them about this yet? Do you know it's probably going to be soon that we, um, yeah. we're going to have a thinger. Can I tell them? Mm -hmm, yeah. We're going to do a save it or shave it thing, right? Because the whole thing was I'm going to grow this out till the church is done and we're getting close. And when we get close enough, we'll do a should Father Joe save it or shave it, It'll and and of course in November, and I I'm, I'm not gonna lie to y'all, it's gonna be a fundraiser. <laughs> we need cheese, okay? And um, side note, by the way, holy crap! Thank you for your support. I, I don't think I've ever asked for money, but dear God, you guys are helping, and I'm so grateful. Holy cow! Um, man, bless your beautiful hearts. So, I'll shut up. I'll give you a hida, and then I will see you for sure Friday, and you'll see a recorded version of me. Any other tomorrow. questions that you have that they want to see on Friday? Oh them. yeah, if you've got questions, sorry. Um, if you've got questions for me on Friday, ship them, and we'll, and we'll have them. Do we think we'll have internet now? Well, of course yes, we will. We'll have, yes, All we right. will. All right, ready? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, you made us for truth. You made us for life. You made us for love. You made us for beauty. Forgive us for the ways that we've taken those wonderful ideas and bent them. Unbend us, Lord, and help us to love truth and to love beauty and to love life. Give us the strength in our struggles to long for heaven and to trust your timing about when we can get there. Lord, today we ask in a special way that you bless all of those who might be struggling with depression. We ask, Lord, that you heal their broken hearts and give them strength and help us to be good support to them. We ask for those who struggle with their gender identity and we ask that our response to that struggle is holy and kind and loving. We ask that you heal our self-inflicted wounds. And for all the people we're worried about, for all the situations that we fret about, we give them to you and we love you so much and we trust you. Even when we're scared, we want to trust you. And may Almighty God bless all y'all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. This is a real joy. Uh, again, you will see a recording of me tomorrow. 
uh, younger me with no beard and I was skinnier. And then on Friday, I'll see you at Mama's house. Peace.